This car. Does anyone remember their second car? Just put your hand up. Bit of audience participation, that's good. My, I purchased my second car three months after my first car. <laughs> Why? It wasn't my fault. It really wasn't. Uh, but I purchased my second car and it was a, a really cool skyline. It, I'm not going to say it was fast because that would be irresponsible. But I didn't buy it for its economy. And uh, it, was, it was really cool to have this car. And, and I was driving it to an exam. I did a, a commerce degree before studying theology. So I was driving to an accounting exam. And uh, like some of you, I was studying something that was totally over my head and really struggling to remember the basics. And I uh, was not concentrating. And I went straight into the back of uh, a really nice car just out the front of the uni. Uh, no mobile phones then or anything like that, so sort of, I remember pushing my car around the, the corner on Burwood Highway and it gently rolled down there and I got it into this spot where I could stop it and I could go in and do my exam. And uh, I remember thinking, just for a split second, it's fine, it's fine, I'm okay, I did the right thing with the other driver and my car, I, I was able to turn it on and it still worked, so it was fine. Went and did my exam, got to say, it wasn't the reason I didn't get a high distinction, but I didn't do super well in accounting. And I went back to my car, and before I rang my dad on a public phone, um, which was a phone that used to be in a box, and you would dial it, and um, before I did that, I thought, I'm going to see if the car will start. And sure enough, it started. It was fine. So I got in the car and I drove it home. Uh, but I wasn't completely dumb to the way cars work. I had my eye on the temperature gauge like a hawk. Because I, I, there was an awful lot of water under my car as, uh, as I started it. But I managed to get home and nothing blew up, pulled into the driveway. Uh, it was fine. Uh, my dad saw the car, my brother was there at the time. They're both far more practical than me. They did a few things to it, they were able to fix it and it all seemed... Okay, they took a few things off. It looked really ugly. Like, I had the ugly car for a long period of time, and as a P plater, that just wasn't a cool thing. But, but it worked, and I needed to get to my job, I needed to get around. Um, I was a bit worried about the water situation. Uh, my dad's very practical. He handed me this four-litre bottle and said, never leave home without that. So on the passenger seat of my car was four litres of water. And uh, every time I stopped, and sometimes when it was still going, I learned you could take a radiator cap off while the engine was hot, if you had enough towels on top of it. <laughs> like, all the time, I had uh, to keep attending to it. And, but the thing is, I don't know if you've had this feeling, right? You know something's broken. You know something's not okay, but in that moment, it's fine. It works. And so your anxiety just drops a little bit. You're not as worried about it. It goes from being, this is super urgent and I need to fix this, to, eh, it's less urgent. It's fine. Until it's not. And uh, I was driving my car. No, uh, the, the story would be so much better if I said I was going somewhere important and the car blew up. It didn't. But uh, I was just driving to a friend's house and it did the usual thing where there was a copious amount of steam coming out from under the bonnet. And uh, I could see the temperature gauge hard to the right. And uh, I'd already used my four litres of water, so I knew I was in real trouble. I'd already used up, there was this stuff you could tip into the radiator, which would like quasi seal it and make it just a fine for a little bit longer, and nothing worked. And I had to get the car towed, fix the radiator, and then eventually uh, got it all done properly. It was all fine until it wasn't. Even though I knew it was kind of inevitable, even though life is just a bit like that, isn't it? You know it's not always going to be fine. Uh, when it wasn't, I remember all of a sudden, I was worried, I was a student, didn't have much cash, I had to get places, I'm like, how am I going to get to work, how am I going to do this? And all of a sudden, when it wasn't, all these other worries came. Now, the car got fixed, I was able to borrow other cars, I found a workaround for it like most of us do, and again, that real problem kind of didn't seem as bad as it was. But when it wasn't fine, it was really bad. <laughs> This series from Daniel, this week and next Sunday, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 4. Today is a preview, really, to next week. The stories we've had this morning have given us a taste of some of this idea of God being present with us when things aren't fine. Because 
at the start of this story, everything's going great for the king we've been reading about. It actually says he was living in comfort and prosperity. It's kind of like not for a moment, for a long period of time. We hear, it's kind of like the king, his name's Nebuchadnezzar, takes the pen off Daniel, who's been writing most of the story, and writes this bit himself. You even get that taste from the start of it. It's like, all right, you lot, I'm having my turn now. Daniel's had a turn, uh, and it's like the king is saying, my turn, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how good God is. It's a bit strange, because we're not sure, we're not told that, you know, a massive conversion has taken place or anything like that, but... This king has come to know some of the things we've talked about this morning. The goodness, the power, and the presence of God. And it seems that he learned it when things weren't fine. There's something about going through the valley that's particularly educational, if not painful, annoying, and downright sore at the end of it. Because our hearts and our minds and everything about us goes through the wash. Daniel 4, 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar the king, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. But one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I laid in my bed. Comfort and prosperity. He has a dream that holds a warning. Then the dream comes true. Things change and time passes. The king says this. After this time, the time that he had dreamed about, the time that had terrified him when he saw it in the looking glass, after this time had passed, I looked up to heaven. My sanity returned And I praised and worshipped the Most High and honoured the one who lives forever. My sanity returned. Sometimes we feel a bit crazy when life doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's exhausting just trying to work out, how does this work? For Christians, sometimes we wrestle with deeper questions too. How is it that this is happening under the watch of a good God who's present in my life? And maybe that's about what's going on in your life or what's happened in your life in the past. Or maybe it's about the bigger global issues. You're kind of wondering, why on earth are these systems, structures, this way of living? Why is this there when there's a God who created human beings, has spoken about how communities work at their very best? How is that there? You'd be excused for feeling a little crazy trying to figure that out. And for this king, there's a definite season, which we'll go more into next week, where he kind of loses his mind. But his sanity comes back. And it's like he gets to the other side of that valley, and when he gets there, the clarity comes. I think we're really good as Christians at talking about what's on the other side of the valley. I think we're pretty honest and real about what it is to be on the in the good side. And I don't think much takes us by surprise. But we're in the valley itself and we're right in the middle of it. We really need to remember that it's not forever. David's explained what forever means so much better than I could. There's a God who is present in the midst of it. There's a God who may well be doing things down in that valley that he couldn't do on the mountains either side of it. And there's a God who is carrying us, teaching us, guiding us, even when we can't find our way. He worships at the end of it. He says this about God, All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, What do you mean by doing these things? No one can question God. When my sanity returned to me, the king says, So did my honour and glory and kingdom. He says this of God to close Daniel chapter 4. All God's acts are just and true, but he is also able to humble the proud. 
Pride is one of those things that just seeps into our life. It's not, hey, I'm amazing, I'm going to puff out my chest and tell you how good I am. It's that subtle sense of, I've got my life in control. I've got the people in my life in control. And whatever happens in my life is because of what I do. The king committed one sin that led to his suffering in this story, and it was that. He thought his life revolved around him. And that the kingdom he had was because he had created it. That the goodness he enjoyed was because he'd lived a good life and and that was the response. And the journey that he goes on is a journey of humility. A journey to say, hey, don't forget, Jesus hasn't said this yet, but God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Proverbs had warned, he probably would have known of this. King Solomon saying, pride comes before a fall. And so there's this sense of us needing to be so careful about thinking that our world is about us and what we do and and everything that comes from there. Most of us are humbled in all sorts of different ways. This king needed to experience this. What do we take from here today in a preview to something much bigger and deeper? We take this sense of, is my life just about me or do I truly believe there is a God above my life who is a part of my life, who lives in me, who calls me to be someone who is a part of something great, something bigger than just me? Because if we hold on to that and we remember that, when we're in the worst part of the valley, when things aren't fine, we know that it's not the end, there's a way forward and one who is with us to take us there. We all sin and all sin is equal. And the great news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ at the cross dealt with all sin. And so we're set free, his grace enables us to come out on the other side. But we are fully reliant on that grace, as we've heard testified to this morning. So sometimes life is fine until it isn't. Sometimes we find a way to make it work, we find a way to keep it going, we put another band-aid on it, we medicate the pain, we do something that takes away the worry, the anxiety, and what it is that makes it come into our face. There's always something deeper that God is teaching, doing, and leading us towards. That's what we hold on to when things aren't fine anymore. That a big God still has life in his hands. Let's pray together. Jesus, we have heard this morning testimony of your your goodness. Our prayer is that as we look upon the cross and the gift of grace and salvation to us, As we think about times in our life where things have been fine and reflect on times where they are, were, or might not be, we are grateful for those promises we heard at the start of today. Jesus, you said to us, you will be with us always. Forgive us for forgetting that. Forgive us for not owning that and holding on to that. And help us to be that, to be the presence of God in the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen.